you can... Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to go off script. Could you put your hand up in the audience if you'd like to own a sports team? Oh, we've got some convincing to do. Anyway, I wanted to introduce uh, the panel. Uh, I'm sure you'll know who they are, but this is uh, Jerry Cardinal, Thomas Rudy, and the legendary Jean Todd. Um, and we are going to talk about disruption in traditional sport. Um, a, a figure, a fact for you, post-pandemic, more private equity and investment has gone into sport than the prior 20 years before the pandemic. So there's obviously something going on in this space, and sport is attracting a wide range of investors from around the world for various different reasons. So we're going to dive straight in. Jerry, who is, um, uh, I think, uh, speaks his mind. Why sport? You're an investor in sport. Why sport? Why now? Well, there's two parts to that question, why sports and then why now? And, and I probably would give you two different answers. You know, the why sport part is less controversial. I'd say, uh, you know, sports is clearly performed as an asset class, and I'm going to come back to that very well compared to other indices uh, and, on, and even on absolute terms. It's the best must-carry content in any local, national, or regional area. Uh, and I've had a very successful 30-year career monetizing this form of intellectual property. It was resilient through COVID. Uh, we ended up going long sports team ownership during COVID uh, because, you know, with 30 years behind us, we knew what, what the value of that intellectual property is. Uh, and the great thing about it is it's incredibly resilient. So as technology continues to disintermediate the consumption of this intellectual property, there's a resiliency with sports that will always have it be a premium. On the second part of your question, why now, that's a little more controversial. I, I actually am not that bullish on, on sports team ownership right now for new entrants. Uh, we have our platform companies with Fenway Sports Group and AC Milan, uh, but I'd say for new entrants looking at owning a sports team, this is very treacherous times. I'd say that you've had this massive escalation in valuations, but you know none of the people or the infrastructure really has kept pace, and so the only way anyone should consider investing in sports today at this moment in time is if you have a company building mentality and you are going to be very hands-on in finding ways to monetize that intellectual property. Excellent. Thomas? Yeah, well, I think uh, Nelson Mandela said sport has a power to unite the world and uh, it really transcends cultures, um, countries, continents, and uh, more than anything, it's something we can agree or disagree on the outcome of a, a football game and kind of a friendly dialogue about it, and that's really the fun of, of, of the sport. Um, no other sector brings passion together in the way um, that sports does, so from an addressable market and um, a dedicated consumer, sports is quite attractive. Um, from the investment perspective, um, I believe in live sports and the value as a media asset, right? Um, you can watch a TV show now on Netflix, on streaming, on TV, everywhere else, um, but a live game is a live game is a live game that is only has value once. And so as more people have the ability to access sports and the demand goes up, but the supply stays fairly flat, the value of sports goes up. And John, you, you were Formula One, Ferrari, um at a time when a lot of money came in. Was your take on that that it was a positive overall to have this investment in, in one particular sport that you were very close to? I mean, clearly, I mean, it has been a great evolution. I mean, if we speak about uh, Formula One, I mean, Formula One now is a global sport. Um, you have three global categories in the sport. You have uh, the Summer Olympic Games every four years, you have the Soccer World Cup every four years, and you have 23 races of Formula One every year yep. all over the planet. And uh, I mean, you can see the two regions around the world where Formula One has increased is the Middle East. You have one race in uh, Abu Dhabi, one race in Bahrain, one race in Qatar, one race in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> and you have the US with now three races, yep. one in Miami, Austin, it was last weekend, and uh, Las Vegas for the first time, night race in, uh, in three weeks. So, th I mean, that's, um, that's fascinating. And that's um, a consolidator for, for the whole planet. You know, everybody, there is no controversy about the sport. Everybody has a passion for the sport. So I'd like to just um, 
talk about investment for a little bit in, in terms of where the money's going. It seems to me you're, you're not particularly bullish on teams per se, but what about disruption um, of formats, which is obviously you have Live Golf, um, there's um, IPL cricket, which is you know, very uh, big in, in the Middle East and, mm -hmm. in, and India, which was a format change. If you were advising anyone in the room, is it better to put a dollar of investment in a disruptive format or a dollar of investment in a team or keep it in your pocket? Well, look, I'm not sure those are, the question's presented in a binary way. I'm not sure it's not more interlinked. I mean, what I've been doing in my career is a form of disintermediation. And what I really love about what I see uh, our colleagues here in the, some of our colleagues here in the audience doing is a form of disintermediation. You know, disintermediation doesn't have to be a bad word. It's a, it's a positive. You know, capitalism is based on that. Um, and so I would tell you that, you know, when you look, a lot of the disintermediation comes in the aggregation of teams, which tends to be around leagues, Yep. right? And, uh, you know, if, if you subscribe to my view on the value of these sports teams as intellectual property, then you should subscribe to my uh, view of leagues as an aggregator of intellectual property, and they're not immune from disruption. Mm -hmm. They need to be disrupted. They need to be disintermediated. They are multi-billion dollar live event entertainment aggregators. Uh, and you know, what's, what's happened though is that I think all of the sports ecosystem has been you know, caught off guard. You know, they, the, the disintermediation is coming and it's happening. Yep. They're not prepared for it. Yep. And so I would say that um, an incremental, to answer your question, an incremental dollar of capital, I would always look to see if that incremental dollar can go into a disruption or a disintermediation. But the challenge with that is you have to have had a lot of longevity in sports uh, to be able to you know, manage that dis disruption and disintermediation responsibly. Tom? And I think a great example of disruption happened right here in the kingdom with the creation of Live Golf, right? Yep. Um, you're going from four days to three days, players have to travel less, um, you call it golf but louder, right? Which is the right approach for having, making golf more exciting. You had a model that had the same golfers over the same time with the same format for too many years, right? And a governing body that got quite uh, content with the way they were, were, they were producing their, their content and, um, and their live, live production. So all of a sudden you have something that obviously the traditional golfers might take a little bit longer to get acquainted with and agree with. You always have pushback when you disrupt and that's what you have to see through. But for a younger audience, this is great. And I really see this happening in tennis, right? You're, you're, at a, you're at a point right now where effectively the greatest tennis players of all time are retiring. Djokovic is still playing. Nadal is at the end of his career. Federer has retired. They have dominated uh, the Grand Slams in the last few years. Serena Williams on the women's side is done as well. So now is the time is ripe to, to spend some money and disrupt it there. Uh, uh, that's a good point. And I would just I'll say one thing that, you know, the, for, for those of us who have been participating in the sports ecosystem for a long time, I would like to see more embracing from the existing establishment in this form of disruption. You know, these things don't have to go in a contentious way. If, if right. I was the incumbent, I would be embracing guys like us in, in that form of disintermediation. It is a positive. It is Darwin. It's Darwinian. And I think we know as students of history that, yep. that you know, that's on our side. So there's a purely an investment angle. But one of the things about sport that I've noticed is that uh, we talk about fans and not customers. They have very strong opinions, as you see, with ownership of teams and pushing back. Um, and sport has a societal impact. Governments get involved. Um, there's a responsibility in sport beyond buying a, a, a consumer brand, necessarily. Um, Jean, you, you've spent the last couple of years um, taking your background in sport and looking at what, what that means and, and how, to, how to engage with um, society and issues. I'm just curious, as you look at sport and owners and your history, do you feel they're missing their, an obligation to promote a better world? I mean, I, I would not call that an obligation, but uh, in fact, I think that uh, if you have had some success in the sport, you need to give something back. And um, talking about um, my personal endeavor and passion, um, I've had always a lot of passion to make motorsports safer. And everybody knows <clears throat> that uh, the year 60s, 70s, in Formula One, you, were, you had 20, 24 drivers, and every year you had about four drivers who were starting the season and not finishing the season because they were dying. 
So we made uh, sports much uh, safer. And uh, between now, 94 and 2023, 20, so in 29 years, we have had one death in Formula One. I would say one death too much, because today it will not occur. So when you do that, you, then you, you see around the planet and you realize that uh, the road is the number one cause of death for young people. Every year, 1.3 million people die on the road. You have 40 to 50 million people who are injured. We're in a beautiful country, 32 million population. You have 7,000 people who die on those roads every year. So you try to see, I mean, how could you come give something back? And uh, in fact, eight years back, I was appointed by the Secretary General of the United Nations as his special envoy to fight against road safety. So we have the prescription. Amongst it, you have communication, education. And who else better than sports people could contribute to do that? And I'm very proud because uh, we just launched a campaign, United Nations, with the GC Deco, who is the number one billboard company in the world. And this campaign will occur, incidentally, in some uh, cities in Saudi, but uh, in 1,000 cities, 80 countries for the next two years. And among the sports people, we have Charles Leclerc, we have uh, Djokovic, we have Marc Marquez, we have uh, Usain Dembele, uh, Didier Drogba, and all they are going to give their image to send message for young people to behave on the road. Excellent. And I think that's also a very strong responsibility of the sport for and any, the athletes. any citizen. Yeah. Sure, I think you, yeah. Yeah, look, you know, when it comes to the fan, you're right. If you look at these as businesses dispassionately, they're your customers, right? Now, the thing, you know, I bring an American orientation by definition to the rest of the world and the stuff that I do. And the one thing that my involvement in European football has definitely shown me is that, you know, sports is a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. It's not really a public-private partnership in America, no. right? Um, and that's a, that's a, they're, they're, America's ahead of the world in terms of the monetization of the fan. But, you know, America is challenged because they have to deliver a value proposition to the fan because they charge a price point that demands that. In the rest of the world, you know, it is a public-private partnership. What's going on here in Saudi Arabia to me is absolutely fascinating. And it's, and it's a huge positive because you see the integration of world-class sport with the impact on society and the community, and it just rises the entire society up. And I think we can learn a lot about that in America. But just to push back a little bit, um, you can own an American football team and be the worst performing team in the league and still make as much money almost as the bottom, as the top. That's so there's a, there's a jeopardy as I said, competitiveness in there. That's I totally agree with you. I, I think that we have not figured out how to monetize the live event at those price points in okay. America. The value proposition has broken down a bit, in my humble opinion, in America. And we have to have a sense of urgency around that because that, you know, the world now, sports is globalized. And, yep. and, and that will move offshore if we don't. Just picking up on um, Jean Todd talking about the athletes promoting stuff. Um, you have athlete investors in your funds. Um, without naming names, are they good investors or bad investors? They're actually pretty good investors. The athlete investor is a concept that's really has gotten a lot of traction in the U.S. in the last 10 years, really. More, more so in the five years where it's become more public. In Europe, that's a concept that really only the top athletes uh, are following. And uh, my personal experience with some of the greatest athletes in the world is that they bring that same mindset of wanting to be the best also to the, to the investment field. And um, it's interesting uh, how many questions I get from multiple world champions and tournament winners of what tax impacts of some investments actually get or whether a stadium is built in an opportunity zone uh, and, and all these things. So um, it's surprising and I actually like hiring also former athletes for my team because that work ethics, the self-motivation that comes from it um, is a great way to engage people in sports. But you know, maybe above um investment, it's about reconversion. Because we know that a career of sports, man or woman, is quite short. So what you do behind? Yep. And uh, so here I have two, two aspects which are very important, influence, because sometimes you, if you are lucky and powerful, performing, then you will get some money. Yep. What will you do with your money? So you need to have a good surrounding to support you, to help you. Uh, and if you get it, and here we have some experts or people who can, who can be a guidance, then 
it will allow to prepare the future career. Yeah. Because when you end up your career as a sportsman or woman, you are young. You know, so the years behind are also essential. Yeah. And I think that's a, actually a great point, uh, just to, to touch on that, because uh, you a lot of times have to deal with financial literacy with, with athletes, and actually in the NBA until uh, recently, 85% of NBA athletes went bankrupt within two years uh, after their career, uh, which is quite shocking. Now an NBA player, the top player, makes $60 million a year. So part of the financial literacy ed education, I think, Sean, uh, should be a, a philanthropic side as well. So not just how do you survive yourself financially after your career, but how do you give back really to the community, to the people that were cheering for you for so long? But, I mean, you, you see that, and I mean, very much... Uh, in the state, you see, you have examples like uh, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, who decide to give half of their asset for people who are in the need. Mm. And uh, to have also a contribution of influence of sports people is absolutely essential. You know, the player side of the equation is, is something to really look at. Um, it, over the last decade, I've seen an evolution in the professional players that I interact with five years ago they wouldn't know what EBITDA is. And, and mm -hmm. in the last five years, EBITDA is in every other sentence. Yep. Uh, and, you know, they, they're, going, they're learning. And with that learning comes that they want a seat at the table. And when you look at the value chain in sports, it's really simple. It's players, teams, and leagues. All of the money has gone to two-thirds of the value chain. None of the money has gone to this one-third. That, balance is, 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 that rebalancing is coming. And it's yep. coming not, in prof not only in professional sports, it's also coming in college. And but I think maybe, there's a, a, a category of sports tech that I think a lot of athletes are getting yes. quite personally involved with as well. You know, not talking only about uh, money, but we know we are in a tough world. So many things do occur. But, I mean, the responsibility of sports people is to give dream, you know, people to give passion, to give emotion, and that's absolutely essential. Yeah. Mm. So we've got a few minutes left. I just wanted to throw in a... a uh, a question, if anyone in the audience has a, a team or a league or something, or a sports tech <laughs> business and they want your money, how, what's the best way to approach you? What are, what are you looking for when someone's got an asset that they come to you with um, to invest in? Well, look, I mean, for, for me, there has to be a, a value add. Um, you know, anybody can just buy stuff. You know, when I started out in the business 30 years ago, showing up with money was the value add. It was the competitive right. differentiator. Today, everybody has money, so what good are you? Right? Yep. Well, what good are you is that if someone has a team and they come to me, I'm only interested if they see a value proposition in what I can bring to that. So when John Henry approached me on Fenway Sports Group, I mean, I, I, it was one of the few instances where I would agree to be a junior partner, but it was because I think that ownership group and that management team is one of the best in sports. I think I can learn from them, and I also think reciprocally I can add value to them. And as you see, you know, when, I, when we started, we had Liverpool, we had the Boston Red Sox, we had New England Sports Network. But when I got involved, we now own LeBron James's media company. We bought the Pittsburgh Penguins, and we have a very interesting expansion project going on in Las Vegas, very multidimensional, where we're hopefully in partnership with LeBron, who came into the holding company with me when we invested, we will get an NBA expansion team. So it's really, you know, today I, I will tell you, you cannot be a passive investor when it comes to sports. I do not buy this notion that you, you know, aggregate capital to, to buy minority stakes in teams that control premium valuations. That is unlevered beta, and, and, and I'm telling you, it, 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 the music's going to stop, and everyone's going to get caught short. I, my only tolerance, and the only thing that I will do, is if I have a hands-on involvement mm. in, in shaping that capital investment. And you've seen some sports where that's been the case. Rugby, I would argue, has been invested in, but not actively, and look where they are now, you know. Yeah, look, I mean, I, no, matter, no matter whether it's the NFL or whether it's, a, you know, a, a, a smaller sport, they're all incredibly legitimate in, in yep. their communities, in, in their demographics, et cetera. And so the, it's all the same type of intellectual property. You just have to price it accordingly. Yep. Thomas? Yeah, and the way we invest at Lead is a little bit different uh, from Jerry investing. We get in very early, pre-seed, seed, Series A, some, somewhat at the growth stage as well. Um, and so first and foremost, we invest in people, just like other tech investors as well, right? If you look me into the eye and you can make me believe that you can execute on a vision, well, then that's a big plus. Um, big focus now 
given that capital is a little bit more constrained where the market is right now, also in sports, um, even though we have a lot of contractually obligated long-term income coming through versus other, other sectors, is a focus on commercialization, right? If you can't look to be a good salesperson and uh, ultimately uh, turn your technology into revenues, well, then you don't have an investable business, right? And this is something that we absolutely look for as well. So, uh, Jean, in terms of investing, what would you, what would you suggest people do? I mean, and, you know, it's uh, like uh, going on the stock market. Make sure <laughs> you, you make the good choice. But, I mean, Formula One. I mean, Formula One uh, has become uh, a much better investment than it used uh, to be. And, I mean, it's interesting to see that uh, you have some uh, investors who are not at all involved in Formula One who start now to be in Formula One. Why? Because uh, now you have 10 very strong teams, you know, who are solid. Uh, we have, uh, at the time, I was president of the FIA, when together with uh, the commercial right holder of Formula One, we decided to create what we called a cost cap. So to limit the expenditure in yep. Formula One to control. So, I mean, it had a double advantage, number one, to make sure that it will not be too big discrepancy between the top teams and the smallest teams. And number two, to make sure that it is affordable. And immediately, it has created a major interest from private sector to invest in Formula One. And um, it used to be a time where every year you had two or three teams who were getting into bankrupt. And now it's a solid, healthy business. Okay, so we have two minutes. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that we didn't, I didn't brief you on, so let me ask the question and then give you some time to think about it. The future, Thomas has already mentioned sport, uh, tennis sorry, as, a, as, a, as an option for the future. I'm quite intrigued by sport-tainment, which is wrestling at one level, but actually there was a football match, uh, soccer match, um, on YouTube the other day between the um, sidemen and the YouTubers, which filled a stadium with 80,000 people and had 200 million views on YouTube and sponsors and media rights to some degree. Looking forward, what, what, what are you intrigued by in terms of either a sport or a category and is, is wrestling sport? Right, well, it, well, 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 one thing you have to, I've always invested with a Venn diagram of sports and media and entertainment uh, over the last few years. LeBron actually uh, educated me that I'm missing a third leg of the stool, and that's culture. Right? Okay. And in America, culture is urban. In Europe, culture is fashion, which is an element of our investment thesis in AC Milan. The two areas that I'm intrigued by, I think, uh, to answer your question, are leagues uh, and youth sports or college. So on the league front, you know, these are, uh, these are the aggregators of intellectual property, as I said earlier, but they're not run that way. These should be multi-billion dollar cash flowing entities. And, you know, controversially, I have said and, and, and and I've advocated that when one of the leagues in America, the, take the big four, the next time they do a media deal, they should take 20 cents off the top and capitalize themselves. Now, you know, that's gonna be hard to do because you know, the cat's out of the bag and, and the owners are gonna look at that and say, wait, you're taking money out of mm -hmm. our pocket. But these leagues should be professionalized. These are mini Disney's. Um, the teams themselves have become mini Disney's in a certain way, but they're only as valuable on the trajectory that they've been on because of what the leagues have enabled. And I think that's fascinating. The second thing is, you know, college sports. I mean, that's more unique to the American um, yeah. dynamic, but college sports is going to get professionalized. Thomas, you've, you've got less than... I got negative time. Nine seconds. I see that. I'm looking at it. No, um, so first of all, I'll start with wrestling absolutely as a sport. Do you see these guys flying through the air and jumping yep. off and hitting each other? Unbelievable. They're real athletes and good actors, too, if you look yep. at The Rock, for example. Uh, what excites me is really disruption, as we've seen it here, right? I, I mentioned tennis. I think there's going to be more sports firm formats that are going to be more made for TV. I think most of them will fail, but I think some of them will actually set ourselves up, and I think AI will play a big role, which will ultimately kill sports, sports betting. Excellent. So sport <laughs> betting is going to die because of AI. I mean, John? you know, what I feel fascinating is, uh, I mean, the way you can have access to any sport you like. You know, now, with a new media, wherever you are in the planet, you can see what you want what, whatever at the you moment want, you whatever want. Whatever you want. And it's absolutely something we should realize how privileged we are. Oh, thank you. We've run over by a minute, but it was a good minute. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank the panel, and thank you for listening to us. Thank you.